The Fearin Saga continues. You defeated the Fearin League, became champion, saved the Fearin region from being conquered by the Divine Pokemon, dismantled Teams Brain and Team Brawn, and restored all of your fractured relationships. But conceptual games Pokemon Brain and Pokemon Brawn were just the beginning as the Fearin Saga continues on in these two conceptual DLCs, The Queen's Beauty and The King's Bounty. But this video will focus on the first one, The Queen's Beauty, as you'll travel to a gorgeous series of islands off the east coast of the Fearin region called the Galdor Islands inspired by the Faroe Islands, which are a series of islands located between Iceland and Norway. They are also close to Scotland, so their culture is a mix of these three, but like Iceland is known for its magical folklore creatures. So because of that, this DLC has a magical or fairy tale theme, drawing from Faroe's folklore, nursery rhymes, and even taking inspiration from the classic Cinderella story with plenty of my own twists within the Pokemon world. Like previous DLCs, each of these will also introduce a bunch of new Pokemon from previous generations not previously available in the region to fit these new environments and each DLC's themes. Both DLCs will also feature 12 brand new Pokemon, as I wanted new Pokemon that captured the essence of these exciting new areas and chapters. So let's see what the Queen's Beauty has to offer and take a look at this exciting new corner of the Fearin region. I've been exploring the Fearin region in an ongoing series here on my YouTube channel and on my Instagram page at Mikemon underscore regions commissioning a variety of talented artists to help bring all of my ideas and designs to life and take you on an exciting journey through my imagination in my own little corner of the Pokemon world inspired by Iceland and Norse mythology. So if you enjoyed this video, please make sure to hit that like button. And if you'd like to learn even more about the Fearin region, for those of you who are new, I highly recommend checking out some of my previous videos as they introduce all of the Fearin region's new Pokemon. I do, however, recommend watching the Fearin Saga series in particular, so you're up to date with the story of the Fearin region, its characters, and the new Forge form mechanic and how it works, as a lot of that will be relevant to this video. But luckily for you, I recently made a supercut video putting the entire Fearin Saga together in chronological order, so you don't have to watch several different videos. And it's even streamlined for your viewing pleasure, featuring lots of new content as it introduces the Fearin region's adorable new mythical Pokemon. So for those of you who missed that big reveal, make sure to go check it out, especially as this video is a great refresher before diving into this video. And of course, please make sure to go support all of the amazing artists I commissioned to bring all of my ideas to life. Their links will be provided in the video description below. So do yourself a favor and please go give them and their own fake mon projects some much deserved love. I promise you will not regret it. Before we dive into the story and explore the new locations and characters found within the Queen's Beauty DLC, I'd like to introduce some of the new Pokemon you'd find in this expansion, starting with the adorable Verminute. Verminute are found in most households of the Galdor Islands, used to keep time. Its name is a play on vermin and, well, minute, inspired by both the house mouse and brown mouse species commonly found in the Faroe Islands, as well as the fable of the mouse that climbed up the clock. You know, Hickory Dickory Dock, the mouse climbed up the clock, except now the mouse is literally the clock. With a clock face, hour hand whiskers that move like those on a clock, clock alarm ears, and a round metallic body hints at steel typing. Its bronze or brown coloring is also a reference to the Faroe Islands native brown mouse species I just mentioned. And even the house mouse commonly found there as well, cause well clocks are found in homes. And as its dex entry stated, even this Pokemon is often found in homes. I also took slight inspiration from Cinderella's mice, as a lot of the characters and story pay homage to that classic fairy tale as you will soon see. And of course to fit the DLC's fairy tale-esque themes, which is where its evolution Al Rodent's new fairy typing comes into play. Al Rodent have an impeccable sense of time, making the perfect companion for those who struggle with time management. Its name is a combination of Hour and Rodent, maintaining and expanding upon the same inspirations and elements as its pre-evolution, but now resembling a grandfather clock, as well as a butler as it's a lot more mature looking, dapper, and poised as it helps keep the house in order and everything running smoothly, and has a tie resembling the pendulum on the grandfather clocks, and a wind-up key tail, once again fitting of its steel typing, and having traded its normal typing in for the fairy typing. Next up is Blah Sheep, as there are supposed to be more sheep in the Faroe Islands than people. 
Beautiful flowers bloom in blush sheep's bush-like wool, painting a wondrous scene as they can be found in abundance just about everywhere you look within the Galdor Islands. Blush sheep's name is a mix of the words blossom, to fit its grass typing and design, and well, a sheep. With shrub or bush-like wool with flowers flourishing on it, in a beautiful pink color to really pop. Blush sheep evolves into Ba Peep. Ba Peep gracefully shepherds the blush sheep that overpopulate the Goldor Islands. Ba Peep is inspired by the fable character Little Bo Peep, who herds sheep, with its design meant to reference and resemble that character as well, which is why I wanted its pre-evolution to appear more feminine, to kind of set the stage for this design. It keeps blush sheep's shrub wool, now forming what appears to be a dress, like Little Bo Peep's, and one of the pink flowers from its wool has now formed a hat, resembling the one that Little Bo Peep is known to wear. It has even gained a wooden crook to help it shepherd its herd to blush sheep around. Like for a minute, blush sheep loses the normal typing in favor of the fairy typing after evolving. That will be a reoccurring theme amongst this batch of new Pokemon, as they are all inspired by fable or nursery rhyme characters, meant to represent them from going ordinary, to extraordinary or magical, as these inspirations truly blossom in these evolutions. The same could be said for the goofy yet adorable Goo Goose. Goo Goose are rather loud and immature Pokemon who without a governess to look after them would get into unspeakable trouble. Goose are yet another animal commonly found throughout the Faroe Islands. I intended for its design to be kind of a counterpart to Ducklet, and it sports the same brown, black, and white coloring of Goose. Actually, I can't believe there's yet to actually be a Goose Pokemon. Goo Goose's name is a play on Goo Goo Gaga, as in like the baby sounds, as it's meant to be a baby, hence its little diaper, as its evolution governess is meant to play its parent or caretaker, inspired by yet another nursery rhyme character, Mother Goose, which its design is meant to pay homage to. Even its name, which is a play on governess, which is a female caretaker or teacher of a household, mixed with nest, as that's where birds live. Governest single-handedly entertain and care for large flocks of Goo Goose until they are ready to leave the nest. Like its pre-evolution, this line was meant to be a counterpart to Swana, as there are some goofy-looking goose like Goo Goose, or beautiful white ones that kind of resemble swans like Governest. Anyways, as I mentioned, all three lines start as normal types, as they are all three inspired by the three animal species most commonly found throughout the Faroe Islands, that inspired the locations of this DLC. And because of that, they would be found all throughout the Goldor Islands. I knew I had to have Pokemon for these three animal species as they are so common throughout the Pro Islands, so I instantly found nursery rhyme characters that applied to each of them, as well as the various themes throughout this DLC perfectly. I was really proud of all the concepts for these three evolution lines and the synergy between them, so I commissioned one of my favorite artists, JJ Mon, to help bring all of them to life, and he didn't disappoint. I'll introduce all of the new legendary Pokemon later on in this video, as they all play vital roles within the story, that way you know where they are found, and what events lead to those fated encounters. However, there is one more new Pokemon found in this DLC. Okay, well it's not that new. Despite already being introduced in some of my previous videos, it's important to note that the new Dugong evolution, Selkie, would not actually be obtainable until this DLC, The Queen's Beauty. As the Seal line isn't found in the Firin region, as I chose to use the Walrein line for the main Pokedex. That being said, the Galdor Islands are technically still considered to be part of the Firin region, similar to how the Sevai Islands are considered to be part of the Kanto region, or the Isle of Armor was considered to be part of the Galar region. I decided to have this evolution be obtainable in this DLC, as it's inspired by a mythological seal and mermaid-like creature known as the Selkie. Yes, I know the name's not that original, but I was playing off the naming theme of Seal and Dugong. And while the Selkie is part of Icelandic folklore, it is more commonly associated with both Celtic and Norse origins, much like most of the Faroe Islands, which, once again, inspired this new location, as the Selkie is also a huge part of Faroe's folklore. So because of this, I felt it was much better suited for this new location, especially as it fits the story's themes of magic and beauty with its long, flowing aurora-like hair. Selkie will also act as Hoenn champion Wallace's ace Pokemon while performing in the Galdor Islands Contest Festival, making use of its dazzling attacks. As Wallace has always doubled as a world-renowned Pokemon coordinator, so I felt it only felt right for him to participate in this contest festival. 
and you'd even get to battle him at the end of this DLC with a brand new Pokemon team and even wielding a Forge Form weapon with epic freestyle sections, but I'll get more into that later on in this video, as his ace for that battle is a brand new legendary Pokemon. Wallace's niece, Licia, who is also an already established coordinator, would be returning in this DLC as well, once again using her ace Alteria, Ally, as I felt it would only be natural for her to tag along with him, given their relationship and shared interests. Plenty of other returning Pokemon coordinators from previous regions would also be returning in this festival, including Licia's self-proclaimed rival, Chaz, and his Machoke nicknamed Machiri, Ghost Gym Leader Fantina from the Sinnoh region, as she participated in Pokemon contests there, Electric Gym Leader from the Unova region, Alicia, and her Zebstrika, even though she's not a coordinator in those games, she's known to command a stage, and I could imagine her using this as an excuse to come home and visit her children in the nearby Theron region. Psychic type gym leader Tulip from the Paldea region and her Espathra, as I could also see her being interested in doing Pokemon contests as a model and influencer. As well as rock type gym leader from the Fearon region, Julia, and her Dymoth, as she has an extensive past as a Pokemon coordinator. However, she will not be participating in the festival, as she is a part of the event's contest committee, which will actually be a part of the story. And of course, your good friend Ragnar is back, and looking better than ever, as they've formed their own team of fashionistas and Pokemon coordinators, known as Team Beauty. Ragnar's new outfit is a mix of their original outfit and their Fantasia's Persona's outfit. Their new outfit now features laced tight leather pants, a puffy shirt, platform heels, and elegant Team Beauty earrings. Featuring the same colors as their past outfits, with the colorful dragon scales in their blazer, like before, and the beautiful Aurora Sheen from Fantasia's dress featured in their new draped sleeves. This outfit is not only bolder than Ragnar's previous attire, but even more androgynous, as thanks to you, they are no longer reliant on their Fantasia's drag persona to battle as they once were. Fun, free-spirited, and rebellious, Ragnar believes that the key to victory doesn't come from either strength or intellect, but from the beauty of Pokémon. Unlike most Pokémon trainers, Ragnar doesn't overpower or outmaneuver their foes in battle. Instead, Ragnar and their Dragon-type Pokémon have always believed in dazzling and distracting opponents with bold tactics and stylish moves that leave a lasting impression. Tactics which will serve Ragnar wonderfully as a Pokemon coordinator in the upcoming contest festival, they are determined to win, with your and Team Beauty's help, of course. Using their partner Pokemon, the Evolution Drekion, as their star performer. Team Beauty is made up of models that double as Pokemon coordinators, like Ragnar, specializing in dazzling Dragon-type Pokemon. But being as their mythology revolves around the beauty of Pokemon, and this DLC is focused around Pokemon contests, you won't really be battling them, but rather competing against and alongside them in Pokemon contests. And you, the player character Emma or Eric, would actually join this team and getting your own Team Beauty inspired coordinator outfits for performing in Pokemon contests. Just how you joined either Team Brain or Team Brawn in the main story. And this isn't to say there won't be any battling in this DLC, there will be but the bulk of it, which focuses on the Pokemon Contest Festival and Pokemon Contests, wouldn't have as much battling. There would be battles sprinkled throughout the story, and more importantly towards the climax and end of the story, as there's some fierce Forge Form battles, just like the ones in the main game, utilizing the freestyle sections. These Team Beauty grunts are made to look androgynous, like their leader Ragnar, who is non-binary, but wouldn't necessarily have to be non-binary themselves. I'll leave that up to you, although I could see them using she-they or he-they pronouns. Instead, I wanted them to smash gender norms with the female grunt looking like a girl boss in a suit and the male grunt pulling off what most would consider to be more feminine attire. Each sporting Ragnar's teal color, the beauty emblem, and cute little purses. With confident poses to show they mean business and hope to change the game with their bold fashion and beautiful Pokemon attacks like nothing that Galdor Island has seen, this DLC also includes a handful of new characters, which I mentioned are all loosely inspired by Cinderella characters, as that's a classic fairy tale that has been retold a thousand times throughout media, so I figured I'd give it my own take within the context of the Pokemon world, as I felt it fit the story and its themes quite well. Except instead of revolving around an extravagant ball, it revolves around the Pokemon Contest Festival in the Galdor Islands. So meet the Cinderella of the story, 
Freya, a quiet and kind girl who has always dreamed of being a Pokemon coordinator, especially as her stepmother Olga is head of the contest committee. But unfortunately, Olga despises Freya, treating her as a mere servant within the household after her father's passing. So yes, she's based on Cinderella's evil stepmother, but with more at stake in the festival due to her position of power. And elements of her ace Pokemon, her ugly, incorporated into her design as she has an ugly fur coat and hat. And another difference is she's a stage mom, and as a result pressuring her two daughters, Gretchen and Gertrude, to follow in her footsteps and become Pokemon coordinators, even using her sway with the rest of the committee, our knowledge to try to rig the competition and give them an unfair advantage. And of course these two are inspired by the ugly stepsisters, so I will admit they are probably the ugliest characters I have ever designed and that is intentional. The biggest difference between these two and Cinderella's evil stepsisters, they are only doing this because of the pressure their mother puts on them. Their partner Pokemon are Granbull and Aromatize, which if you look closely, their designs take inspiration from, especially within their hair. Just as Olga's design takes inspiration from her ace Pokemon per ugly. And as I've mentioned in a past video, Olga was a former gym leader on the mainland of Firin, specializing in the normal typing, before retiring here to the Galdor Island and taking over the contest committee, as she once was a Pokemon coordinator herself and was even the rival of the Rock-type gym leader in the Firin region, Julia. And that relationship and rivalry will be resurfaced later on in this story. As it just so happens that Julia is a member of the contest committee as well, much to Olga's dismay. But even as president, she doesn't have the power to remove her. Anyways, back to Freya. She feels invisible as she hasn't really had any friends since her father passed away years ago. However, she does have the wild Pokemon found on this island, as in her isolation, she has somehow developed the extraordinary ability to talk to Pokemon. Her confidant being a scrappy verminate that lives in her home. And it's kind of like her Pikachu, she never actually caught it with a Pokeball, but it's essentially her Pokemon. This ability will end up being useful later on in the story, as Ragnar and Team Beauty hope to use it to help them find the legendary Pokemon Matriarch. And in exchange for her assistance, Ragnar will act as her fairy godmother, giving her a makeover and welcoming her into Team Beauty so she can freely participate in the Pokemon Contest Festival without her stepmother Olga's interference. Olga being head of the Pokemon Contest Committee already doesn't like Team Beauty though, as their flashy outfits and tactics on stage oppose her more traditional values. But more on these characters and their Pokemon teams later on, as I dive deeper into the story and explore these events and islands one by one. Speaking of which, now that the stage has been set, let's start at the beginning and explore the Galdor Islands. So the DLC starts with Ragnar telling you about the contest festival in the Galdor Islands and offering you a makeover as long as you join and represent their newfound team, Team Beauty, as they feel having the Furin region's reigning champion would be a good look for the team. Your mother encourages you to go as your best friend promises to help your mother around the lab, as they've taken over as her new assistant. So you go to the city of Husil and set off on this epic adventure arriving on the island inspired by the most famous island in the Faroe Islands. The name I chose to give it is Norse translating to Clover as this is a lush green island full of plant life and grass type Pokemon. In fact, each of the major islands has an element it is themed after. The first is themed after nature with plenty of grasslands, farming fields, beautiful flowers, and forests. But more on its location and Pokemon in a bit because after arriving, you have some business to take care of. You'd settle into this charming city inspired by the cozy capital in the Faroe Islands. Here you'll register to participate in the festival as a Pokemon coordinator. However, you'd get some pushback from the head of the committee, the old fashioned and snobby Olga, who is repulsed by Team Beauty's bold sense of fashion that goes against her more traditional values. Luckily, your old acquaintance, the Rock-type gym leader Julia, is also in the area for the festival and just happens to also be on the contest committee. She was actually Olga's rival back in the day, as I previously mentioned, informing her frenemy that you are the reigning Furian champion, in which case she's embarrassed, reluctantly welcoming you. So it appears Ragnar's plans to use your champion status as a buffer for Team Beauty worked. So Olga will storm off, leaving you to catch up with Julia, who will give you the tutorial on Pokemon contests for any players not familiar with how they work. And once again, for the record, they will work just like in previous games, with maybe a few little changes to update them. 
Afterwards, you'd meet up with Ragnar and Team Beauty, as your first mission before the first contest on this island is to search for the divine Pokemon of Eternal Beauty, Mate Roark, who Ragnar and Team Beauty have chosen to worship as they look to capture this deity and make use of its untold beauty, as it is said to have found refuge in these islands long ago after a legendary Pokemon threatened to destroy the main Firin region back at the time it was still known as the Cedar region. Which a lot of you I'm sure already know and will go full circle in the next DLC, The King's Bounty, as this Pokemon will make a return. Anyways, back to Matroark. While the runes to its ancient kingdom remain on one of the Galdor Islands, its whereabouts are shrouded in mystery, although there are many tales on these islands revolving around it. These very tales of its immense beauty are what are said to have started the contest festival in the Galdor Islands in the first place, as it was the citizens' way of honoring this divine Pokemon associated with beauty in hopes of getting it to emerge and grace them with its presence. So as I said, this island is flourishing with grass-type Pokemon, and of course all the new mods can be found all over as well, as they can on most of these islands. There's a small village inspired by those in the Faroe Island where you'll once again encounter Olga, as she has her daughters, Gretchen and Gertrude, try to fend you off in a tag battle. After defeating them, with ease I'm sure, Olga says she would expect nothing less from the Fearin Champion, who managed to beat Odin, implying that he was an old flame. She then tells you as good of a Pokemon trainer as you may be, you won't stand a chance as a Pokemon coordinator against her daughters on stage. As she starts to storm off, but the two twins, being a little ditzy, are both a little starstruck after hearing you are the champion of the Fearin region, and are called by their mother like dogs. This town is one of the best places to catch Goo Goose or Governest. In fact, they are pretty much found anywhere throughout the Goldor Islands with water or near water. The next few areas on this island are farm fields similar to those in the Lowford farmlands in the Fearin region, with a lot of the same Pokemon, but with some slightly different Pokemon not found there as well, followed by a field of flowers similar to the new bloom fields in the Fearin region, once again with a lot of the same Pokemon including Twerple, as well as new ones not previously obtainable in the Fearin region, such as the Roselia line. As despite being used on Cynthia's team in the post-game, Roserade and its Lance Forge form won't actually be obtainable until this DLC. Next, you'll arrive at this charming little village where Ragnar and Team Beauty will meet you. Ragnar says this is where Olga lives, and they'd like to speak to her personally to try to resolve their issues. So you'd arrive at her house as Freya is cleaning it. She challenges you to a Pokemon battle as you have technically entered unannounced. Afterwards, she tells you if you're looking for Olga, she's not home. I'd imagine she's probably off somewhere trying to get Team Beauty cancelled, but who knows. Anyways, Ragnar sees a drawing of a dress and asks Freya if she drew it. She says yes, and that she's always dreamed of being a Pokemon coordinator. So Ragnar asks if she's participating in the contest festival, and Freya says her stepmother would never allow it. Besides, she has nothing to wear. So Ragnar takes the drawing and says, what about this? And quickly uses their skills as a fashionista to throw a dress together with help from their Team Beauty grunts. Acting as her fairy godmother, giving her a complete makeover, even welcoming her into Team Beauty. Freya is worried her stepmother will recognize her, and Ragnar says, so what? At least she'd finally see you for the beautiful person you really are. This is the first time Freya has felt seen or beautiful in ages. And she says she can't thank Ragnar enough, in which Ragnar responds, that's what friends are for. Freya teary-eyed says she's been waiting for friends for a while now, as she's been lonely cooped up in this house. As her verminic climbs onto her shoulder and starts squeaking at her, as if it's offended, being it's her best friend. She starts talking to it laughing, saying of course she meant human friends, reassuring it how much she loves it, as they appear to be having a full-blown conversation. Ragnar instantly picks up on this, as Freya ends up confiding her secret in her new friends, telling them that she can talk to Pokemon. Ragnar says that there's something she can do for them after all, asking if it's possible for her to use her abilities to speak to Pokemon in order to help them find the divine Pokemon, Matroar. So she asks her for a minute, and says she'd be happy to do what she can. She does say that the only way to get it to appear, from what she's already heard from the nearby Pokemon, is to find the three keys, each being entrusted to one of the three divine serpents that serve Matriarch. Freya says she knows this because one of the three serpents' castle is on this very island not too far away, located deep within the forest. So naturally, Ragnar asks her to take them to it. The three legendary serpents are three legendary dragon-type Pokemon for each of the starter types, grass, fire, and water, inspired by the three iconic dragons from Norse mythology. I'm probably going to butcher their names, so please forgive me. These variations all reimagined as the loyal guardians of the divine Pokemon, Matriarch. 
So in order to find and enter its secret chamber, you must first find and defeat all three dragons in the Galdor Islands, each with their own castle. First up is Nithgaia, the grass type representative, based on Nithog, the dragon at the roots of the world tree, hence its tree-like design and grass typing. Next up is Fafurno, inspired by the gold fire-breathing dragon, Fafner, which explains its gorgeous golden color and fire typing. And last but not least, we have the water type, Jormarine, based on arguably the most iconic of these three Norse dragons, the world serpent, Jormungandr, which is a sea serpent explaining its water typing. Now, Zygarde is already loosely inspired by the same creature, but emphasis on loosely, so given Pokemon has repeated concepts before, I wanted to make a more literal interpretation, giving it the water typing, as I felt I couldn't really make a Nordic region without a Pokemon inspired by this beast. All three of these serpents are obtainable after defeating them at their respective castle within the Galdor Islands. The grass-type serpent being here on this very island, so prepare for a challenging battle against this beast. Okay, after battling and hopefully catching this legendary Pokemon, and receiving the first key, you'd be able to go back to the city on the island and participate in your first contest festival. It is in this festival you'd face off against familiar faces such as Tulip and Harasspathra, and Coordinator Chaz and the Machoke Matri from Alpha Sapphire and Omega Ruby. Fun fact about the Furrow Islands, the islands have a very well-developed road infrastructure with a series of large underwater tunnels connecting the islands. So if you look closely at the map of the Galdor Islands, you can see these little roads dipping down into these underwater tunnels connecting these islands as well. While you don't have to take these tunnels to travel around, you can take a boat or even surf between the islands, I recommend checking out these underwater tunnels as you would be able to find some rare items, Pokemon trainers to battle, and some unique Pokemon in these underwater tunnels including Cyclozar which can't be found anywhere else. Before exploring the next major island, I'd like to offer some fun tidbits about the Galdor Islands real fast. For example, the Deerling Line, which is new to this expansion, and its various seasonal forms can be found throughout the Galdor Islands. Summer form on the first island, winter form on the snow-covered island, spring form on the more advanced island, and autumn form on the volcanic island. It's also important to note that the Galdor Islands would have even more bug types than the Fearin region, as the Faroe Islands has a lot more insects than Iceland, which isn't known to have a lot. That being said, it is Pokemon so I did take liberties with a lot of the bug type representation in the Fearin region, adding Pokemon I felt fit its biomes, but I got to have a little bit more fun with the bug types here. Despite being considered part of the Fearin region, another difference between it and the Galdor Islands is you would not be able to find any of the Fearinian regional forms or evolutions here on the Galdor Islands. But you would still find a large number of the Fearin Pokemon in the Galdor Islands, especially staples such as the Aquak line, as they both share a lot of the same wildlife and even a lot of the same mythology with things like elves, gnomes, and witches being very common in the Furrow Islands as well. The next island is inspired by the iconic and magical floating lake in the Furrow Islands, which is basically an optical illusion, which also takes inspiration from yet another iconic city within the Furrow Islands, which is built around this giant inlet. You take a boat over to this island and participate in the next festival where you'd compete against Wallace's cousin Lysia from the Hoenn region and her Alteria Alley. But before doing so, you'd encounter her up at the beach town up on the north end of the island. Make sure to catch some of the new water type Pokemon while you're here because a lot of them cannot be found anywhere else in the Galdor Islands or in the Fearin region. Anyways, after encountering Lysia here, Ragnar is absolutely starstruck not only recognizing her, but hearing that her cousin, the greatest Pokemon coordinator of all time and Hoenn champion, their idol Wallace, is in the Galdor Island and participating in the festival. In which case Wallace appears, introducing himself to you, and Ragnar absolutely loses it, groveling at Wallace's feet, before composing himself. Wallace then says what an honor it is to meet you, the Fearin Region's champion, after having heard of how you defeated the Divine Pokemon, saved the region, and mastered the once thought to be barbaric Forge Form phenomenon, almost making it trendy, saying he himself would like to give it a try while in the area. After this interaction, Freya would appear, saying a lovely governess has told her where to find the next key, saying there's a castle housing one of the other legendary serpents on the nearby lake. Here you'd find a variety of new water type Pokemon, not previously accessible in the Fearn region, and of course the next of the three serpents, Jormarine. After receiving this key, you'd finally be able to participate in the next contest, and then move on to the next island. 
And while the bulk of the story and all of the Pokemon contests take place on the major islands, there are plenty of smaller islands to explore, many of which taking inspiration from landmarks from the Faroe Islands, such as a fantastical isolated island off the mainland covered in a fluffy cloud, which is quite magical. And plenty of magical Pokemon, especially of the flying type, would be found here. In real life, despite being uninhabited by humans, this island is visited as a tourist destination. There's also a little island with a sea cave you can surf to. Inside this massive ancient underwater cave, you'll be able to find wild fossil Pokemon like you could in the Crown Tundra DLC, primarily those of the water typing, but you'll be able to find even more on some of the other islands, which I'll get into later. I also included an iconic island from Iceland, featuring the world's loneliest house, as I felt it would fit more with the island aesthetics of this DLC. Here you'll be able to explore a haunted mansion, featuring some ghost type Pokemon from the Fearn region, such as the Kamara line, as well as some new ones unique to this location. Most of the Pokemon here are inanimate objects, to kind of give off a Beauty and the Beast vibe. While all over the Galdor Islands, this is also the best place to catch the Verminit line, as it's commonly found scurrying about the corridors of this estate. You'd encounter Fantina here as well, as she is intrigued by the Omnis estate, and you'll later encounter her on one of the later islands, where you'd compete against her in a Pokemon contest. Okay, now back to the story and off to the next main island, which is inspired by the colder climated areas in the Fro Islands, or even the islands in the wintertime, with a little resort of igloos high up in the snowy mountains, like those found in the Faro Islands, some iceberg islands like those found in the Boral Bay of the Fearn region, and a snow-topped forest and cave, all housing a variety of new Pokemon, particularly of the ice type, not previously found in the Fearn region, as well as some of the old favorites. As I mentioned earlier on, like in the Crown Tundra DLC, you'd also be able to find plenty of fossil-type Pokémon in the wild in some of these islands. This island has a handful, including the ice-type frozen fossils from the Fearin region. This is also the best place in the Galdor Islands to catch the seal line, because while it's found all over, the northern lights used to evolve Dugong into Selkie are located here. And Selkie, once again, is technically new to this DLC. But you can also catch a dugong here and go back and evolve it underneath the northern lights in the Fearin region. Anyways, you'd climb the mountain to view the northern lights, as Ragnar will appear, saying there's nothing more beautiful than this, as you take in the sights. Freya will then show up to tell you that the Pokemon on the island told her that the last of the legendary serpents, nor the divine Pokemon, can be found here, but apparently told her that the whereabouts of the last serpent are on the volcanic island making it your next destination before participating in this contest festival where you'd finally face off against Wallace and his beautiful Selkie. After winning this contest, Wallace says they are clearly impressed and can't wait to see how you do in the final show, which will feature everyone and be what really determines the true winner of this contest festival, as these contests on all the various islands leading up to it are more for show, each focusing on a different type of style associated with contests. So after receiving word that this is the location of the last legendary serpent, you'd sail off to the volcanic island of Hitoros, which took inspiration from the more modern homes of the Faroe Islands as I felt they'd fit the darker aesthetic to this location quite well. This island is also home to, you guessed it, a variety of fire-type Pokémon, many of which found in the Fearin region, with the exception of a couple such as the Magnarok line, as it and Jotundra are exclusive to the Fearin region, Fireschult and Iceschult Mountain due to their rich lure associated with those locations, and the legendary Frostfire. But you'd also be able to find plenty of new Fire-type Pokémon, including my baby Maui, aka the Houndour line. The volcano area is also home to even more fan-favorite wild fossil Pokémon unique to this island, including the Spinozier line from my first Fakemon region, the Luika region, which you'd find swimming in the pools of lava. It is on this active volcano, you'd find the castle to the final of the three serpents on a lake of lava. After defeating Faferno and receiving the final key, you'd be greeted by gym leader and coordinator Fantina from the Sinnoh region who witnessed you battle and say she looks forward to seeing what you've got on stage, as you'll be competing against her and her Miss Magis in the next contest on this island. Okay, so you've got all three keys, but before you can seek out Matriarch, you need to travel to the next island for yet another contest. I took creative liberties for this more modern and technologically advanced island, just for more variety. Not to say there aren't any modern cities or towns in the Faroe Islands, just not as built up as this. 
but Pokemon always takes these kind of liberties, and I didn't want these islands to be just a copy and paste of the Four Islands, because this is a fictional place, and what is the fun in that? Anyways, this location is home to a variety of Electric-type Pokemon, including Fear and Fan favorites such as Vesplug and Sproutlet, as well as many new ones unique to this location. It is also home to a power plant, which you must travel to before performing in the next contest as the power in the city has gone off thanks to one of Olga's schemes to try to disrupt you and Team Beauty as you've been doing so well in the festival despite all of her best efforts behind the scenes. After going to the power plant and turning the generator back on, you'd have to battle Olga who refuses to let you and the rest of Team Beauty cause any more damage to what she says is the pristine reputation of this festival. Of course she uses normal type Pokemon as she was once the Fear and Region's normal type gym leader before returning to these islands a few years back before Minnie and Magnus came to the region becoming gym leaders. Now don't forget this was back before the gym leaders were prompted by Champion Odin, or the divine Pokemon Ed Loden, rather, to use Forge Forms, so she wouldn't have used one. Not that I could imagine her doing so. However, I can't imagine she would have been an early game leader like Julia as they are rivals. Not to mention there's plenty of normal types in the early game of the Fearin region. I can especially imagine Perini and Benary being her ace as it's nice and fluffy. Her current team, however, doesn't really feature any Fearin Pokemon outside of Rattata Scroll. As I really went for the snooty and pampered aesthetic with these normal types, most of which aren't even found in the main Fearin region, being unique to the Galdor Islands. And I chose to give her normal types, not only because a lot of them fit this snooty aesthetic I was going for, but because it represents her unwillingness to change, and how stuck in her ways and old fashioned she is. After defeating Olga, she storms off powerless. Then you'd be able to proceed to the next festival, where you'd face none other than Minnie and Magnus' mother, Elisa, and her Zebstrika in a charged performance. Afterwards, she personally thanks you for your involvement in dismantling her husband Thor's team, as she was disheartened to hear that it kept him away from their children, especially as she already has to spend so much time apart from them in the Unova region, where they were raised, by the way. And she left them in Thor's custody, hoping that he would take care of them and watch over them while they were here in the Fearin region, as Thor himself grew up here in the Fearin region. But she says while she's in the area, she'd like to make it up to them and give them a surprise visit back in the Fearin region. Now off to the final island, where the final performance and contest featuring all of your previous opponents and many more will take place. In this almost fairy tale-esque medieval inspired town, this gorgeous fantastical island is home to many fairy and dragon type Pokemon. This is also the only place to catch the Serenoy Slime from the Luika region, meaning its melodious forge form, which shoots magical sound arrows, wouldn't be obtainable until this DLC as I felt it was another perfect fit for the aesthetics of this enchanting chapter. The Dewarmer line would also be found on this island, as it was quite rare back in the Fearin region, but will be a lot easier to find here. I almost gave Dewarmer a new beauty-inspired split evolution just for this DLC to fit Team Beauty, but ultimately felt it would conflict with Matriarch's design and possibly even typing, as it would already act as a new ace for Ragnar. And the dragon fairy typing just felt like the natural fit. More importantly, it would defeat the purpose of Ragnar gifting you their shiny Duormer in the main game, as they felt you could help it better reach its full potential. So I'm sure Ragnar would not be happy to find out the shiny Pokemon they gave up had a beauty-inspired evolution all along. I know I wouldn't, so all of that would have been in vain. And the point is, Ragnar is nothing like their brothers, and forges their own path, so I think having an ace Dragon-type Pokemon outside of that line helps represent that better. But once again, Ragnar will still catch this divine Pokemon, which is already a dragon type representing beauty. Which is fitting given this island is also home to Matriarch's castle. So I hope you have your three keys because before participating in the final contest, Ragnar wants to finally capture this divine Pokemon and use its power of beauty to blow the competition away in a show-stopping finale. Okay, now let's take a look at the DLC's namesake, the Queen of Beauty herself. The beautiful and fierce Matriarch. Inspired by Norse goddess Freyja, who is associated with love, beauty, and magic, hence her fairy typing, and inspiring all of the various themes of beauty and magic throughout this expansion. The connection to magic is why it shares the fairy typing with legendary Edlodin, inspired by Odin, and it's fair to say that it also takes inspiration from Norse goddess Frigg, who is Odin's wife and mother to Baldur, or in the Marvel comics, Thor. Hence the name Matriarch being a play on Matriarch and Roar. To fit her dragon typing and design, which also has subtle cat-like features, 
to reference the cats associated with Freja that pull her chariot. So once again, this Pokemon is kind of a mix of both Freja and Frigg, but more so Freja. In fact, Matriarch's symbol, or the beauty symbol rather, is inspired by Norse god Freja's symbol with cat-like tails to reference her relationship to cats or spiraling like serpents to reference the three legendary serpents that serve her. It also resembles a shield as that is what her forge form is. As Freja is often depicted wielding a shield, and it's fitting of the Pokemon's maternal nature and need to protect and cherish things. Matriarch also has a new signature ability called Ineffable Beauty, preventing the opponent from using any status moves, as well as a new signature attack known as Fierce Elegance, which is a strong fairy-type physical attack that lowers the opponent's strongest stat, with them having no way to raise it any higher, so together they can be quite useful. Matriarch is as kind as it is majestic, helping to look after and care for all of the wild Pokemon within the gorgeous Galdor Islands. Legend has it, Matriarch will gift those it touches with eternal beauty. Like the other divine Pokemon, Matriarch can speak and has a personality of its own, being a lot nicer than the other three divine Pokemon of the region. However, unlike those divine Pokemon, it doesn't feel the need to have a trainer wield it as its forge form weapon as it's not interested in battling, and is happy with the simple, elegant life it lives here within the Galdor Islands in which it basically rules. Ragnar obviously has their sights set on it after choosing to form Team Beauty around its stories, as they just really spoke to Ragnar, who's always been into fashion and beauty, and desires its power of eternal beauty. However, they aren't the only one because after finding out about your plan, Olga will want to find this legendary as well, and send daughters Gretchen and Gertrude after it, so you will have some competition in your search. But once defeating the legendary serpent trio and finally finding it in its own fable-esque fortress, before you or Ragnar get to battle it, it turns out your friend Freya, using her ability to speak to Pokemon, happens to beat you there, and Plot Twist has already captured it, essentially betraying Team Beauty and Ragnar even after all they did for her. This is because she's enjoyed all the attention she's gotten since joining Team Beauty, but is scared of being invisible again, and the clock metaphorically striking 12, like in Cinderella's story where all the magic wears off. She says she can't go back to being an irrelevant nobody, so in order to prevent that from ever happening, she wants Matriarch's power of eternal beauty for herself. Ragnar, obviously not happy, challenges her to a battle, but using Matriarch's immense power, she quickly defeats them. So naturally, you challenge her to a battle, and if you manage to win, she has to hand Matriarch over to Ragnar. In this battle, she will use a full team of six featuring Fable-esque fairy-type Pokemon, including the new fairy trio introduced in this very expansion, with her wielding this divine Pokemon's Forge Form weapon at the end of the battle, making the freestyle sections of this battle quite difficult, as having a defender type means you can't do any damage in the freestyle section, therefore you can't charge your Forge Force Gage or use a finisher move unless you get her from behind, which won't be easy as she moves pretty fast, and like Cynthia in her freestyle sections, gracefully dances and twirls around the battlefield, executing her own series of attacks using her razor sharp shield. She has a twister-like attack where she twirls around the entire battlefield real fast, doing continuous damage if the attacks land, a dragon claw-like attack where long claws grow out of the shield and she lunges at you, making a series of slashes that you must block, and a magical attack where she holds her shield up into the air and glorious pillars of magical energy consume the battlefield, doing massive amounts of damage. This attack is extremely hard to dodge, so you must disrupt this attack as soon as you see her start to lift that shield. After defeating her, she will do as promised and give the legendary Matriarch to Ragnar she knows just how bad they wanted to capture this Pokemon. So Ragnar thanks you for your help, and Freya makes amends with the two of you, apologizing for her rash behavior and going more into detail about how she was feeling. As Ragnar comforts her, telling her that the makeover and newfound confidence wasn't brought out by magic and has always been there inside of her. She just needed someone to bring it out of her and show her how to believe in herself. Just as you, the protagonist, did for Ragnar earlier on in the game, which Ragnar himself will tell her. After all is said and done, you all agree to go on to the last contest of the festival and give it your all. And no matter what, you will remain friends and root for one another. 
And of course, that is your next destination in this DLC as you go to that final contest, facing off against all of the coordinators you've faced so far in an epic showdown, which you of course would win as the spotlight shines down on you and you're not only the champion of the Fearon region, but now the winner of the Galdor Islands World Renowned Contest Festival. But the story doesn't end there. So after winning the Pokemon Contest Festival, you'd be able to battle two new bosses in the form of Ragnar, who is now wielding Matriarch, and Wallace wielding a new Pokemon, Nykoran. Ragnar's team will pretty much be the same outside of the addition of this new legendary Pokemon, and a new Flygon, with the freestyle sections playing out very similar to Freya's battle, wielding the same weapon. But of course, has a different Pokemon team for the more turn-based style sections, which could really change things, and would have beefed up special attacks. So this is your final battle against your good friend. After defeating Ragnar, they will gift you Matriarch, as they feel you deserve it not only after beating them, but after all you've done for them throughout this entire journey. So this will be a nice ending for this beautiful friendship, as the two of you have really evolved throughout the Fear and Saga. As for Wallace, he can be found on this little island, searching for his own legendary Pokemon, Nykoran, with its own set of stores in the Galdor Island. Nykoran is a water dark type Pokemon based on the aquatic horse-like creature, the Nykur, found in Faroe's Folklore, with a dark past, which is why I chose to give it the dark typing, and incorporate that into its dex entry, which goes as follows. Legend has it, this huntingly beautiful Pokemon only emerges from the sea at the dead of night beneath the full moon. It uses the enchanting eyes on its tail fin to lure those whose hearts are filled with darkness to the depths of the ocean as retribution. I wanted to make it look both sinister yet majestic, using darker colors and shading to represent the dark side of beauty, such as Temptation, as this Pokemon uses its darkness to lure trainers to their doom. And if you think that's dark, go read some ghost type entries within Pokemon. There are some really scary and messed up ones. Anyways, I absolutely love this Pokemon who can only be found at the dead of night under the full moon, which would just paint a beautiful scene. As far as its design goes, I worked with a talented artist, JJ Mons, once again. I wanted to give it huntingly beautiful blue colors, resembling that of the ocean depths, with rough wavy hair like the waves of the ocean. Some fins, like a sea monster or the Kelpie or the Nykur it's inspired by, as well as a false fin tail with glowing red eyes as it uses this to lure people into the depths of the ocean. And these glowing red eyes really pop amongst all these dark colors, making it look quite spooky. With its trident crown being incorporated into its piercer type forge form weapon, which is of course a terrifying trident, wielded by none other than Wallace. Wallace, having just caught this legendary when you arrive on this island, is surprised you managed to find it as well, and says if you managed to defeat him while wielding it, then it would be only fair that you're its rightful owner. In the freestyle sections of this battle, Wallace will have special water-based moves, using overwhelming waves to flood the field. These attacks are quite difficult to dodge and can drown you if you're not careful. He has a whirlpool attack, sucking you into the center so he can do continuous damage, an attack with a series of waves that crash on the field, and even a massive tidal wave attack that would end the battle. Being a piercer-type weapon, he can also throw his trident long distances in addition to his powerful close combat attacks. And once again, after defeating him, you will receive Nykoran and its Forge Form weapon. There are also other Forge Forms in this expansion for legendary Pokemon Xerneas and Yelvitol, as they have Norse inspirations, which are perfect for the Galdor Islands themes of beauty as the Kalos region also had a theme of beauty, both of which being piercer-type bows, Xerneas shooting magical light arrows, and Yelvitol shooting magical dark arrows. And a few other Pokemon and Forge forms that I've already revealed, such as Roserade and Serenoise, would not be available until this DLC. Anyways, I really hope you enjoyed this DLC and the continuation of the story. I will be posting the second DLC and providing the actual climax for the entire Fear and Saga in my next video, so please stay tuned for that, as I cannot wait to show you how everything ends.